In episode 50, we cover a lot. Don't worry, we go fast. Taking a look at where we've been and where we're going. Could you slow it down? We look at a summarized version of how the SDLs came to be. Everything from the chassis, the decoder install, to the preparation for paint. We take a look at the ground lights. We go on a tangent and get some inspiration from some fellow modelers. We take a look at the BNGP35. I show you how I install class lights. We apply the decals, upgrade the lights to LEDs, touch on weathering, and of course see a classic run by. And also check out what the curmudgeon's gripe of the week is this week. Only in this episode of Sue the Milwaukee Road. Hello everyone and welcome to Sue the Milwaukee Road. This is the 50th episode and I know what a lot of you are thinking. I slept through that many? Nonetheless, I hope some of you were able to pick up some tips along the way. Again, I'm just documenting my railroad. I'm not here to try to make all these, uh, you know, miraculous claims. It's just showing you some of the techniques. It's not the absolute only way you can do something. It's just another way to do it. Uh, in this particular season, we cover a lot of the SDL 39s and this is going to probably be the end of the SDL 39s until Scale Trains comes out with theirs. We are going to take a look at the GP35. I didn't get to the elevator that a lot of people want to see scenery and structures and well, you can only go on so many tangents throughout a season. So I went on plenty of them this season and hopefully in the future we're going to get to some of these structures, uh, finalizing them, make them look a little bit more like the prototype. But bottom line in here today is I want to look at a few of the things beyond the railroad and that's actually some of you modelers that are out there, whether it's YouTube channels, podcasts, guys here in the Twin Cities, guys around uh, the country as well as even globally. Uh, there are a lot of you out there that have inspired me. I thank you for that. I can't cover every single person that has, but know that if I've checked out your channel or if I've commented, I genuinely like seeing the stuff that you're doing. So keep it up, keep the content coming, and hopefully I can give you some inspiration as well. Well, let's get moving. We're going to check out the thumbnails from each video of Sue the Milwaukee Road. Don't worry, we go fast. Could you slow it down? You could always hit pause. Let's go. Well, we've covered a lot in five seasons. and I've gotten older. But we looked at the details early on in season one. I'm not going to go through these all in the nitty gritty because we all know. Nitty gritty takes time. Season two, we dove into a lot of other elements, including some stuff on the GN in 1970. I looked at a lot of little details and was working on a lot of projects that ended up being freight car related. I wasn't working on the railroad itself, and as time progressed, I knew, you know, I got to get to the railroad. And by the time I got to season four, that's what happened. I started looking at the construction of the railroad, ended up diving into some of the details still, became obsessed with LEDs and operations, but that gives your railroad a purpose. And of course, season five, we got obsessed with the SDL 39s. And finally, Scale Trains is coming out with them, but I still need to finish the trio. And that's what we're going to look at today is beginning to end where the SDL 39s started and where they're at today. Thanks a lot for tuning in. Appreciate it. We'll look forward to future episodes of Sue the Milwaukee Road. Well, here they are, the three amigos. We are the three amigos. We are the three amigos. The SDL 39s, number 583, the Undeck, and 590. Obviously, I'm going to renumber these, get them painted, and, well, let's just get this started. As you can see, they started out in kind of rough shape. They weren't ideal, but the price was right, so here we go. We make the purchase before Scale Trains makes their announcement, and we start diving into these things. I end up blowing them apart and going through the details. Now, 590 is going to get stripped down to nothing. I end up reassembling it as well as testing the drive. I put the uh, decoder as well as the speaker I was originally going to use into place. Now this is just a test fit, it's a TCS decoder with an iPhone speaker, and this is before I realized that Scale Sound Systems was going to come out with a great speaker. The final step I take is getting measurements of the locomotive for the decals before it goes to paint. Now in this application, I'm just measuring each of the uh, levels or the planes of the locomotive for the future decals. Now these did get painted by fellow modeler Joe Binish. Hello. You tell us all the time. But if it wasn't for Joe, I wouldn't have gotten these things to where they're at today. 
The 581 was wrecked at Sacred Heart, Minnesota in 1983 and scrapped the following year. The remaining nine units were transferred to the Sioux Line Railroad when it acquired the Milwaukee Road. All were subsequently included in the sale of the Sioux Lake States Division to the new Wisconsin Central Limited, eventually to the CN and eventually off to Chile. Which of these Milwaukee Road locos wore the numbers 581 to 590 prior to the SDL 39s? Was it A, RSD5, B, RS12, C, RSC2, or D, AS616? We'll find out later in this episode. And it's time for LED installs. All right, after bombardment of questions about the LEDs and the SDL39, we're going to take a look at that uh, step light, the step light here that has uh, an LED installed. What goes into it and uh, how easy it is for you guys to do it too. And you say, easy, it's not easy. This stuff is tiny. I can't see it. Well, this is one of the techniques that I use. And if you don't like dealing with such small little LEDs, uh, these guys are here to help. Evans Designs, I've mentioned these guys before. I'm using Pico LEDs, 7 to 19 volt. Warm white, that's what's key here. Uh, temperature, if you're used to an incandescent light in your home, those would normally be 2700. That's the same type of light that's going to be used underneath on this particular step light. Uh, if you want to go a little bit cooler, you'd go to 3700 or a 3500, uh, depending on uh, the LEDs that are available. A lot of times when you see cool white, those are actually closer to 5000 Kelvin. I did not know that. Uh, but what we're focused on here, first and foremost, is making sure that this thing doesn't get out of control underneath to begin with. So what I do is I loop it underneath the frame. I get it into position like so. I end up taking Kapton tape. This is the orange tape that often you're going to see on a locomotive. Uh, maybe it's holding wires down over the motor, uh, but it can handle heat. Uh, it's great for taping down electrical leads as well as taping down uh wires for your lighting that might be in the top of your locomotive shell. I end up just taking a small bit of it and I tape it right below the LED. So I end up putting it right like so. And then now I take the wire on this side and I start to pull it down, get it into position. And I just use the toothpick to help guide it. Once I kind of like right where the LED is at, I like it where it's at in the housing. I'm pushing the Kapton tape down so it's gonna be held in place. You can see the LED move just slightly. I pre-ground the back of the uh, ground light out. I just ground it out with a Dremel tool. So this application, I knew I was gonna be doing it. So if I take the LEDs here, there we have it. I got the LED underneath there and you can see the other one's lit. I do put a little bit of black paint on the back side of the LED. So that LED that's shining at us uh, won't be as bright. So you've got the two LEDs lit, ground lights are ready to go. And this locomotive is starting to light up. Undoubtedly one of my favorite things is checking out a fellow model railroader's layout. Here we're taking a look at Mike Christensen's Chicago Northwestern modeling the summer of 1981. You gotta like that yellow and green. He's got himself set up in such a way that there is just a small little duck under to get to the center of the railroad. It creates a circular shape with a little branch line that goes off the side. And here we're just taking a look at the overview of the yard. Uh, this is kind of from the center portion and you're looking at it as it swings towards you. And as these tracks come towards you, there's a little branch line that swings off to our right. This is the branch line, kind of makes it fun for switching. But one thing I did want to bring up is Mike on the left is taking care of Mike Moore on the right, his collection that he acquired over the years after passing. This is a daunting task for any fellow modeler, so anybody that has a collection of a large size, keep in mind those that are left behind. Mike is doing a great thing here, not just by having a sale, but it was one of those things that I was fortunate enough to make connections myself and get to know fellow modelers. We do have another modeler that we connected with, which is Tom Wenzel. Hello! If you've not seen any of this modeling, it's exceptional. Now Tom is a detail oriented modeler and I always can appreciate the details that he dives into. Let's take a look at one of his runbys as they roll by. One thing I like to note is the flavor of the rolling stock and kind of the order in which cars are selected. Now when things are on a real train you can see like the auto racks are all kind of clumped together. They're going to destinations, they're going to places. Keep those things in mind to give that flavor. Because this clearly has the flavor of the Milwaukee Road. How many times is it going to say flavor?
If you'd like to check out more of Tom's work, you can go to the Milwaukee Road Modelers page on Facebook. He's posted a lot of things there, and it's great information. It's nice work, Tom. And speaking of nice work, Sean McGrath has done a nice job on some older equipment. He's a younger modeler, but when it comes down to getting the details down, he's definitely dialing it in. He worked on some SD10s and GP20s. There's an interview on Sean's trains that you can hear a little bit more from Sean McGrath, as well as Sean Hoppert. Now, if it's interviews you like to listen to, you can tune into a lot of different podcasts, but I've always liked the AML, A Modeler's Life podcast, as well as the Crossing Gate here in the Twin Cities. There's a number of modelers that kind of converse, just talk trains. Here's BN2503. It's a former Great Northern unit. It's a GP35. This is an Atherin ready to run that I've added class lights to it. I upgraded the headlights as well as the rear lights. The uh, ground light has been added as well as a beacon. So of all these little things that have been added to the locomotive, you can definitely snap up what was an RTR or ready to run locomotive. A little bit of weathering was done as well. You can see the class lights on those. It's just silver. It's just silver paint. So I drilled them out. I end up putting in an LED, and I'm going to show you how I go about that right now. All right, we're going to keep this segment light. Not make light of any of these details that we're working on. But we will light up these class lights as well as the uh, front step lights. I'm going to give you a look at these. This is the nose of an STL39. I got the LEDs temporarily lit up there with just a 9-volt battery. But you look inside here, and I've actually glued the LEDs um, there's one just on the bottom. So I, I used to use two, one on each side for the, the step light, um, or actually the front porch light. And then the class light was the same thing. It's just one, and then there's going to be one on this side. I tried to do one with, um, fiber optics, but this whole thing, it wasn't working out quite well. So I just want one LED on each of the class lights and it's working well. I'm not going by color, tri color, anything like that. These are just going to be white. Um, since the area I'm modeling doesn't use the red or the green uh, indication anyways, I'm not going to go that route. I do use uh, one millimeter fiber optic to be able to create the class light. Uh, this is just a thin material. I've mentioned it numerous times in the past. Uh, I ended up picking it up online. Uh, this John D at trainiacs.net. Um, you can go on eBay, uh, but anyways, you can just even search uh, one millimeter uh, fiber optic and you're going to get the same material. Uh, you notice that this piece of sandpaper here and there's a bunch of circular uh, motions or pattern that has been developed on here and that's because I take the fiber optic material after I've cut off a piece of it and I go in a circular pattern and I'm rocking it in a circular pattern to be able to create a rounded class light. So I'm just rounding the tip of the fiber optic to then give myself in this application, it's kind of tough to see, but with that dark background, hopefully you can get this thing to focus. You see I've rounded the front of this and that's gonna then be able to create the lens. So I just take, um, normally I've got my snips, but I've got scissors here and that'll do just as well. Cut it off, set the excess aside. And then on the back side, this little piece that's left over, I do the same thing or similar, at least try to knock off the sharp edge just to be able to slide it into the nose uh, or into the housing here. So what we're going to do is just slide this into place. Of course, brass locomotives already had the class light in place, the hole, but you can just drill out uh, for a one millimeter. It's just a nice snug fit. Um, I eventually get this down as close as I can to where I like it. I actually leave them sticking out just a little bit. Uh, I will recess this one just a little bit more. And same with this one. Once uh, the glue within has completely dried, I am using uh, tacky glue. I mentioned this in the past too. I like this. They come in a three pack at Michael's or Joanne Fabrics or Hobby Lobby. This one you can clearly see I've used it a ton. This is the quick dry. Um, this is the traditional tacky glue. And there's another one that is fast grab. Uh, and that's just so it sets quick and grabs onto whatever you're gluing on. I already got another LED here. Uh, this one here is more of a nano size. And uh, I got these from Lighthouse LEDs. And they're referred to as an 805 SMD warm white uh, Lighthouse LEDs. And I end up picking up 10 of these, but they show up like this. <coughs> this is where you scream because uh, these particular pieces, you have to solder your own magnet wire on there. And I got magnet wire from engineering.com. Uh, they do N scale or even small LEDs. And these are the ones that I'm using. So I've soldered them up. That's a little bit crazy to try to solder your own. But in this application, I think it's going to work well. I end up cutting down that extra sprue that we've got inside there. I cut down the class light as close as I can, not right down to the to the brass, but close enough. And then I set a large blob of glue down in here. 
And I think it seems like, boy, that's a lot of glue. Um, the reason for that is to be able to set myself up a little bit of a housing where you're going to be able to paint it silver and you're going to have a little more reflective value. Your, your goal here, because the glue dries clear, is to get it to just emit and illuminate that clear glue. Remember on the LED, on uh, the yellow side is the front. So I want to make sure that's going to be going down. So I put the glue or the tape, Kapton tape, on the back side. I bend it a little bit of an angle to be able to help get it down in there. And I set that glue, just that or that LED, just kind of pointing right up into the fiber optic. I'm going to add a little bit more glue on the opposing side because when I do come back and add a little black or silver paint, a lot of times I add silver because I want to create the most illumination around the LED as possible. So I've just built it up. So now when that dries, we're going to be in a position to be able to have a nice set of class lights. All right, and there we have it. A pair of class lights are lit. The front porch lights are lit, or the step lights. And just for illumination factor, it's kind of a cool little detail to add to any locomotive. Have you licked your finger, held it in the air to see which way the wind was blowing as to which way you're going to guess this week? Did you guess D? Well, you'd be wrong. It was C, RSC2. The renumbers did not last long. As soon as the SDLs arrived, the RSCs were scrapped or renumbered again. As for the RSC2, Elko had constructed the Milwaukee's version of the six-axle road switcher in 1947. It is to note that Elko unit was originally numbered 977, then it bore the number 581, the same as the SDL39 shown here, before being renumbered to 577. Huh, talk about a bookkeeper's nightmare. Well, it's time for decals. As you can see here, we're laying out Circuit City decals. Now, 588 isn't on the sheet, so I am having to customize and create 588, but we're going to just kind of sit back and take a look at a little decaling, a little solva setting, and, well, a nice end product. As we near completion of the SDL39, some of the details I start to tie together is the hand grabs and using racing paint works well, especially on plastic grab irons because it's flexible. With the final exterior details done on 588, we've moved to the interior, and the last things I've got to do are put in the LED headlights. I use the fiber optics, I use the Kapton tape, I end up putting these in, lighting them up, and I think they look a lot better than incandescent bulbs. As I move to the front of the locomotive, I'm going to do lit number boards. I do this by pulling through the LEDs, getting them into place, but the biggest thing is I'm going to have to build the actual number board. So I have to mock those up, and I use an old Atlas number board. I cut it up, and I sand it and file it and get it into place. So this is what I've got for number boards. These just need their decals, and then it's time to move on to weathering. And for weathering, I use Doc O'Brien's weathering powders. Uh, the highlight white and grungy gray are primarily what I use on a locomotive. It's not always exclusive. I work from photos, but the key is using a soft brush. That ends up putting the chalk on a lot softer and smoother. Now, as we walk through the weathering technique that I'm going to use here, yes, it's sped up because this thing took over 25 minutes to get it to where you're going to end up seeing it. But the end product is very similar. My thought process here is always go heavy on the highlights, Go light on the dark. As you can see the white I'm laying down, it looks like it's fairly heavy. When you dull coat this, it's going to show up as a dark gray. If you lay down a dark color and you lay it on heavy, that's just going to get darker. So you don't want to add too much. Subtlety goes a long way. So less is more. Now we've moved on to the car body. One of the things I want to do is draw out the details. And I do that by using grungy gray across the bottom to try to bring out some of the doors and the door latches on the side of the locomotive. Another element that I draw in is bringing in the gritty yellow, and that's actually putting it all over the locomotive to kind of fade it a little bit. I'm going to fade that orange by adding a little yellow, and I put it up into the black because instead of using white, white will make it look gray. Adding this yellow will make it look a little more brown. If you look at the photos, the black kind of looks a little bit more brown, and that's just because of the dirt and grime that has been built up over the years. So keep that in mind. It doesn't always have to be black. It doesn't always have to be white. 
you can use some of those neutral colors to bring it a softer look. Enough already, let's see this thing in action on the rail. Here's a curmudgeon coming at you for the gripe of the week. The gripe of the week this week is about those people that come over to see your railroad and they say, Oh, do you still have that toy train set up? Oh, this one looks a lot like my cousin Carl's that he used to have around his Christmas tree. It's just a little bigger. When you run the engines, do you go choo-choo? What do you, dance? I'm telling you right now, this is a model railroad there, sweetheart. Model. The key is it's a model. I'm telling you, do you drive around in your car going vroom, 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 vroom. Yeah, maybe you do. I don't quite know, but I'm telling you right now, those people that don't quite know, we need to educate them and let them know that it's a model railroad. And that's the Cremachance Cripe of the Week. Model. The key is it's a model. A big thanks to everybody that watches to the end that has hit like, hit subscribe, as well as made comments in the past. It's those actions that help share this content, so if you haven't checked out other episodes, feel free to do so. You can also check out the tour of the GN in 1970, as well as the past episodes of the GN in 1970. 70s. Model. The key is it's a model. Model. <laughs>